Ever since I entered physics, people have been talking about this machine, the Large Hadron Collider, the biggest machine ever built by human beings, is finally going to turn on. And after many, many years of waiting and theorizing about how matter got created and about what the deep fundamental theory of nature is, uh, all those theories are finally going to be tested. And we're going to know something. And we don't know what it's going to be now, but we will know, and it's going to change everything. And if the LHC sees new particles, we're on the right track. And if it doesn't, not only have we missed something, but we may not ever know how to proceed. We are at a fork in the road, and it's either going to be a golden era, or it's going to be quite stark. <laughs> and I've never heard of a moment like this in history where an entire field is hinging on a single event. Hi. Hi. I'm David. Uh, Fabiola, nice to meet you. Yeah. So, uh, look, I have suggested to be on this side because this uh, big wheel is quite spectacular. Yeah, yeah. This more than ever, this will require the collaboration between the theory and experimentalists, so it will be a very nice period where we will work together. And, uh, well, I, it's fun to finally interact with experimentalists. I mean, I used to be just in my office coming up with I don't you know, know, crazy ideas. You have ideas. to come and make your calculations here yeah, yeah. in front of this big, uh, <laughs> well, big instrument, right yes, that to would get be inspired. That's <laughs> a big thing. There is a general sense waiting for this machine to start, this massive machine that has taken so many years to build, uh, we are all in great anticipation of what it might find. And every time there's even a rumor that a new particle was discovered, even before it turns on, uh, the entire field goes into a fever pitch. The experiment was designed initially in the mid-80s and has taken this long to construct. There are 10,000 people of over 100 nationalities. That includes countries which are mortal enemies of each other, like India and Pakistan and Georgia and Russia and Iran and Israel, all have physicists working on this machine. These big blue things are seven ton superconducting magnets, which have to be cooled with liquid helium to the coldest temperatures on Earth, colder than empty space. There are 100,000 computers connected all over the world to deal with the data. In fact, the World Wide Web was invented at CERN so that physicists all over the planet could share the data. The United States was building a machine just like this. In fact, a bigger machine in Texas. But they ran into a small technical difficulty. I doubt anyone believes that the most pressing issues facing the nation include an insufficient understanding of the origins of the universe. Unfortunately, the superconducting supercollider was canceled by Congress in 1993. And finally, he's saying, well, if we don't do it, the Europeans will do it. Let them do it. We'll steal their technology like they steal our technology. 
it got very political. Uh, it was very expensive, very complicated. It's hard for physicists to explain why we do these kinds of experiments. The purpose of the machine is not military application, it's not commercial application. It's to understand something about the basic laws of physics. There are two kinds of particle physicists. They're the experimentalists. They build the big machines, run the experiments, analyze the data, and try to discover things, like new particles. And then there are the theorists, like me. We construct the theories that try to explain everything we see in nature. Without us, the experimentalists are in the dark. But without them, we'll never know the truth. <laughs> I mean, you go, it won't be so terrible. But... <laughs> when I was at Stanford, I had a mentor, Savas Dimopoulos. Savas only likes to work on the biggest puzzles. Now, uh, just for fun, I wanted to tell you that uh, uh, the enabling technologies that... He has some of the most famous theories that will be tested at the LHC. But he doesn't know if any of them are true. So there's an intensity with which he approaches physics. If he works on a paper that could result in a Nobel Prize, he doesn't allow more than three people on the paper because you can only share the Nobel Prize with three people. That's the level at which he's operating and the impact he's trying to have. And takes us beyond the confines of atomic physics. In particle physics, you have to have a threshold amount of intelligence, whatever that means. But the thing that differentiates scientists is purely an artistic ability to discern what is a good idea, what is a beautiful idea, what is worth spending time on, and most importantly, what is a problem that is sufficiently interesting, yet sufficiently difficult, that it hasn't yet been solved, but the time for solving it has come now. waiting for this experiment, the LHC, for a very long time. Nothing like it has ever happened. All the superlatives are justified. This is the case where the, where the, where the hype is, uh, the hype is approximately accurate. <laughs> to get, you know, 3,000 people to work on an experiment together whose goal is to understand what's going on at distances a thousand times smaller than the proton. This is, you know, this is a, a really extraordinary testament to what, uh, to, to some of the some of the highest ideals we can have as, as, as human beings. It's, it's... Nima and I got our PhDs around the same time. He's a couple years ahead of me. And Nima is the, the star of our generation. And he's the guy we all followed and looked up to and tried to keep up with and tried to outpace if we could. Since the mid-70s, we've had an amazingly successful theory of nature that we call the standard model of particle physics. But sitting in the heart of the theory is a sickness, very, very glaring conceptual problems that infected this fantastic understanding. Why is the universe big? Why is gravity so much weaker than all the other forces? The kinds of answers that this theory gives to these questions seems so patently absurd that we think that we're missing something very, very big. And on top of all of that, there's one prediction of this theory, absolutely crucial for it to even make internal theoretical sense. And this is the famous Higgs particle. The Higgs or something like it must show up. If it doesn't show up, there's something truly deeply wrong, very, very deeply wrong with the way we think about physics. Uh, there are strong reasons to think that at least some of these questions will, will find answers at the LHC. There's been no shortage of ideas for what uh, they might be. Um, but uh, this is really um, this generation of peoples, my generation of peoples, only shot. Hi.
même si les gens doivent se déléguer, ils doivent se déléguer, le délégué du PS est sur le Ah, sur les boss cars. Non, je ne sais même pas, je n'ai pas marché, je n'ai pas dormi, je n'ai pas besoin. Non plus, mais bon. Mais ça marche bien. I first came to CERN in 1987. I was a very young uh, undergraduate student. And I remember the first time I entered the site, I was a bit scared by the corridors then in the CERN uh, main site. So I was almost lost in those corridors. For me, it has been a wonderful experience because I had the chance of being involved right from the beginning and to see really an experiment from uh, starting and, 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 and uh, from zero, essentially. I've seen two event displays out of the ten, and we probably have seen the other ones. I don't think I can describe right now the excitement about First Beam. I mean, the entire control room is like a group of six-year-olds whose birthday is next week. You know, and there's going to be cake, and there's going to be presents, and all their friends are going to be there, and they just, you know, they just know it's going to be great. You know, they're kind of scattered, and I, I can't imagine, because they're not that big, right? I've been a postdoc here for a year, so I'm a relative newcomer. But my timing is sort of perfect. I mean, to be on the ground floor when the data first comes, it's awesome. means I have 5,000 emails. There's a huge difference between theorists and experimentalists. I mean, when I started college, I absolutely did not want to do physics. Physics meant to me everything that was boring. Textbooks, theories, proofs. But then I discovered the experimental side. And the experimental side is the hands-on aspect. It's about taking a theory, which is abstract, and making it real. How do you build an experiment to discover something that the theory predicts? And that aspect is what I love. Bon, c'est très bizarre. Oui, arrive ton message contre parce que ça c'est bizarre. Il voulait savoir le larme. Je ne sais pas si c'est implémenté pour nous. Ok, bon, à tout à l'heure. Alors, alors, so, t'as ça ma vie question. T'as ça, t'as ça ma là. Vi avons donc ni là unten. Of course, when constructing the whole thing, uh, we several times thought, what if? The whole thing just does not work. Now, I really believe now this will work, but the next thing is, will we ever find something? So maybe we will just find nothing new. It would be a catastrophe for physics. Yeah? We, we, we would somehow, none of the open questions which we have at the moment would have been answered. So the LHC is basically the most fundamental of experiments. It's like what any child would design as an experiment. You take two things and you smash them together. And you get a lot of stuff that comes out of that collision and you try to understand that stuff. Now, in this case, what we're smashing together is tiny protons, which are inside the center of every atom. And in order to get them going as fast as possible, we have to build this huge 17-mile ring. And we run those protons around the ring multiple times to build up speed, almost to the speed of light. And then we collide two beams going in opposite directions at four points. And at those four points are four different experiments, ATLAS, LHCB, CMS, and ELISE. Now I work on the ATLAS experiment. And ATLAS is like a huge seven-story camera that takes a snapshot of every single collision. And that's billions of collisions. And the hope is that we'll see the very famous Higgs particle. But every time we've turned on a new accelerator at a higher energy, we've always been surprised. So the real hope is that we'll see the Higgs, but that there's also something amazingly new. You can liken it to when we put a man on the moon. It's that level of collaborative effort. I would say it even bigger than that. This is closer to something like human beings building the pyramids. Why did they do it? Why are we doing it? We actually have two answers. One answer is what we tell people, and the other answer is the truth. <laughs> I'll tell you both. And there's nothing incorrect about the first answer. It's just it doesn't, it's not the thing that drives us. It's not how we think about it. But it's something you can say quickly, and the person you're talking to won't you know, get diverted or pass out or, or pick up the Sky Mall catalog if you happen to be
be next to them on an airplane. Answer number one, we are reproducing the uh, physics, the conditions, uh, just after the Big Bang. We're doing it in this collider and we're reproducing that so we can see what it was like when the universe just started. This is what we tell people. Okay, answer two. We are trying to understand the basic laws of nature. Um, it sounds slightly more mild, but this is really where we are and what we're trying to do. We study particles because just after the Big Bang, all there was was particles. And they carry the information about how our universe started and how it got to be the way it is and its future. At the beginning of the 1900s, it became clear that all known matter, everything that we know about, is made of atoms. And that atoms are made of just three particles, the electron, the proton, and the neutron. In the 30s, other particles were discovered. And by the 1960s, there were hundreds of new particles with a new particle discovered every week. And there was mass confusion until a number of theorists realized that there was a simple mathematical structure that explained all of this. That most of these particles were made of the same three little bits we call quarks, and that there are only a handful of truly fundamental particles which all fit together in a nice neat pattern. And there was born the standard model. Eventually, all the particles in the theory were discovered, except one, the Higgs. And the Higgs is unlike any other particle. It's the linchpin of the standard model. Its theory was written down in the 1960s by Peter Higgs and a number of other theorists. We believe it is the crucial piece responsible for holding matter together. It is connected to a field which fills all of space and which gives particles like the electron mass and allowed them to get caught in atoms and thus is responsible for the creation of atoms, molecules, planets, and people. Without the Higgs, life as we know it wouldn't exist. But to prove that it's true, we have to smash particles together at high enough energy to disturb the field and create a Higgs particle. If the Higgs exists, the LHC is the machine that will discover it.